God is good. And all the time. Um, <clears throat> these testimonies touched me. These testimonies, especially about the, um, the last person when he said, Jesus healed me because he loves me. That touches my heart. The message I'm going to try to make very clear today I'm going to try to keep it as short as possible. The message is going to be just simply, Jesus loves you. Let us bow our heads and close our eyes for just a moment. Dear Holy Spirit, I come to you in the name of Jesus Christ. And Father, I ask you, pour out your spirit in this place. Touch my lips, touch my mind, God. Everything that is of me, I put away, and Holy Spirit, I come into obedience of you. Open the ears of people, God. Open our spirits to understand you. We cannot see you. We cannot touch you. But we know you're here because you testify that we are the children of God. And I thank you for your love today. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. So my name is Vlad Stepanov. I'm from Spokane, Washington. Thank you, Jesus. So I come from a background. I've been here before. I testified and um, said my testimony a little bit. And I talked about my drug-addicted past. I was addicted to meth. I was addicted to heroin. I grew up in a Christian house. I grew up in, with Christian parents. But somewhere along the way, I got lost. Somewhere along the way, I went, I went astray. I went after the things of this world. And I remember when I was in rehab, I was God will provide in Everett, Washington. They just opened up. This was over three years ago. I was one of the first students there. You know, I came, I came there. About three weeks on the program, I started changing. I started looking at myself, at my surroundings, where I fell. I started praying. I was not baptized in the Holy Spirit. I did not know what speaking in tongues was at that time. I came from a church, uh, from a family with a Baptist background. So it was something I didn't know much about. I didn't know much about the Holy Spirit. My parents love Jesus, and the church they go to loves Jesus. But the Holy Spirit isn't preached there often. And I came there. I'm hearing people speaking in tongues, and, you know, I'm, I'm seeing prof prophecies and prophets walking around. And... You know, this, it was very new to me. About a week and a half into being on the program, I started asking God for repentance. I've repented many times in my life. I repented in jail, I don't know, at least 10 times. At least 10 times. I've repented in jail and I've repented on the streets. Uh, I had a pistol to my face. I repented then. You know, all, all these situations just led me to repentance. When I was between a rock and a hard place, I'd say, Jesus, my life is yours. But as soon as Jesus frees me, I go and I do what I kept doing. But this time something was different. Something inside of me was screaming out to me and telling me, you're made for something bigger than this. See, what's interesting, as a child, as growing up, when I was five years old, I actually went up and down our street. There's this um, Russian song. I'm going to try to interpret it. It's a very Slavic, um, the Lord is coming soon, and it's like, repent. Um, I'm not going to sing it in Russian, but I would, walk up and down the, I would walk up and down the streets, and I would sing that song, the Lord is coming soon, repent. Um, and I would preach. You know, I'd see our neighbors getting drunk or getting high or smoking a cigarette. I'm five years old. You're going to go to hell. I always had a passion to preach. I always had a passion to talk about God, about a God I didn't know. I wanted to talk about a God I did not know. When I was in drugs, many times I tried to take my life. I tried to take my own life. I was in situations where I was looking death in the eyes. I was in witchcraft. I was in sorcery. I was in communication with demons. And the whole time, there was something inside of me that was telling me, you're for something better. You're designed for something else. 
There was about a six-month period where I went completely atheist. But I called out to God. I didn't believe in him. I didn't know him. But I would pray to him, God, something inside of me my whole life was telling me, God, was telling me that you're made for something better than this. There's one who loves you. And you're called to preach his name. But I didn't know who he is. So being at rehab, I start praying about a week and a half in. I start praying. When I got there, I made, my, I made a decision. There's no going back. I got to change my life. I didn't come there seeking, for, seeking God at first. I came there first to get sober. I was on my way to prison. That kind of scared me. I was um, out on a big bond for a, a, a bunch of crimes I did. And, and you know, that, that was kind of shaking me. Another thing, I, I overdosed about four or five times within one month period. Um, I ended up dying, seeing demons come and try to take me to hell. And I remember the very last time that when I was preaching, I mean, not preaching, I was overdosed. Sorry, my mind just went off. But um, my last overdose, when it happened, I cried out to God. There was a demon about from here to the wall that was laughing. He was laughing at me. And he was saying, you're mine now. You're mine now. What frightened me the most about this demon was this demon is a demon that I've seen on the side of my eyes for a very long time since I was about 14 15 when I started just drinking but then a the time came when I was talking to him face to face believe me or not but God is my witness I asked him for finances once and within an hour I went from broke to fifteen hundred dollars in my pocket he gave it to me he told me where to go what door to open and it was right there God is my witness. See, I was doing things like that in the spiritual world. And I thought I encountered power. But when that overdose happened, when I was out of my body, watching my body being slapped around and shaken, I looked up and there was that same demon laughing, saying, you're mine now. I cried out to the Lord. I cried out to the God I don't know. I cried out to the God I only heard about. I cried out to the God I only knew how religion displays him to be. And I remember I heard the softest voice in my life saying, son, this is your final shot. And I felt this pain come over me. It wasn't my pain. It was a pain from within. I remember I woke up in the body. Fast forward, I'm at rehab and I start asking God to give me repentance. I said, God, give me repentance. Give me repentance. Three weeks in, I'm, I'm brewing the floors. The Holy Spirit touches me. He touches me. He speaks to my heart. He calls me by name. I go and I repent. That same evening, I get baptized in the Holy Spirit. We fast forward a little bit. I ended up going to jail. I ended up going to jail. No spiritual father. Just came to know the Lord. I go to jail. I go to prison for over a year. My heart was broken. My heart was aching. And I was praying, and then there was about a week where I relaxed, where I stopped praying, where I wasn't reading the word, I wasn't spending time with God, I was just, I went into this very depressed um, mode, knowing my wife is about to give birth to her second child, and now I'm on my way to prison, waiting in county jail for the bus to come pick me up. And I remember I went to sleep once, uh, one night I go to bed, and I have this dream, the most realistic dream I have ever had. It's been almost three years and I remember it to the detail. I remember in this dream, I fast forward like I did my year and a half in prison. And I walk out of prison with, with my box, with my property box. And I remember I walk out and I'm looking, I'm expecting my wife to be there to pick me up. And I'm walking out, I'm excited. You know, if anyone here has been in jail before, they know that feeling when you get out. It's like Christmas. <laughs> you know, you're going home, finally. And, it's, and this dream was so realistic. I had, in this dream, I had memories of me being in prison and all the things I'm about to tell my wife. And I remember I come out, and no one's there to pick me up. My wife isn't there. And I remember my heart starts hurting. I'm like, what's going on? So I walk all across town. I walk home. 
And I remember I come home, the door is open, and I walk up to the refrigerator. I drop the box, and my wife's nowhere to be found. Walk up to the refrigerator, and there's a note that says, I'm busy right now. I know you want to spend time with me, but I'm really busy right now. We'll spend time later. I remember my heart breaks. I start crying in this dream. I, I get cold and just this pain. And church, understand this. The way I loved my wife in that dream, the emotions I had for her, I still don't love her to this day that much. I don't love my children that much. And I remember I call her work and her manager picks up. And I'm like, hey, let me, let me speak to Julie, please. Let me speak to my wife. And I hear her manager say, hey, Julie, come here. Your husband's on the phone. And I hear my wife yelling in the background, tell him I'm busy right now. Later, later. I remember I was walking around town in this dream and I was crying and I was heartbroken and I was crushed. And every time I would try to get in touch with her, I would hear the same thing over and over again. I'm busy right now, later. I remember I was, I don't know why, but I was in a mall parking lot in this dream and I fell to my knees and I started crying. And at that moment, it's like my spirit came back into my body and I woke up. It was the weirdest thing I've ever experienced waking up from a dream. And I hear a vocal voice. Not inside, I heard it in my room. But I love you even more, Vlad. But way too often I come and I want to spend time with you, but you tell me, God, I'm busy right now. Later. The love of God. The love of God over you. Sometimes we think we need to climb a ladder. Sometimes we, want, we think we need to reach high places to get to, go, get to God more. You don't. A lot, of us, we want, a lot of us, we want to encounter Jesus. Who here? Raise your hand if you want to encounter Jesus. If you want him to come to you more during prayer. In your dreams. Amen. <laughs> the way you want to encounter Jesus is nothing compared to how he wants to encounter you. Quick testimony, when we were at the conference, Kingdom Domain, Jesus came to me. He held my hands. He hugged me. He brushed my hair. I felt him. I knew he was there. And he told me one thing. He said, do you love these visits? I said, God, Jesus, you know I do. He said, so do I. A lot of times we think we need to do something in order for God to love us. Sometimes we think we need to do something in order to have Jesus visit us. No. In Revelation it says he st stands at the door and knocks. He stands at the door and knocks. Who remembers that feeling on the day you repented? That happy feeling. He was right there. The moment you needed him, you knew he was there. You believed it. You felt him. You felt his blood washing you. You felt his power coming over you. You felt his presence. But time goes by. After time goes by, it's like he's far. When a husband and wife get married, they don't distance each other from themselves. If it is a loving relationship, they come closer and closer. Relationship on Jesus Christ. Jesus comes on the scene and he comes into your life he doesn't just want to save you just so you go to heaven the father's prayer is let your will be done and let your kingdom come who here believes that before you can you will experience heaven up there heaven has to come down heaven has to come when we step into heaven, when we die and we pass over, we have to know those feelings, you should have relived them. 
If you get to heaven and it is the first time you experience Jesus or look Jesus in the face or felt his presence, you've had a very sad Christianity here on earth. And the biggest problem is we think we need to reach God. We need to run after him. We need to chase him. Before we go into prayer, I'm going to share a revelation that I very recently had, and I only shared it with a couple people, and I shared it with Dennis here on the way here today. I was praying and reading a few weeks ago, Matthew 6, 6. It says, but when you, but when you pray, Go into your room, and when you have shut your door, pray to your father who is in the secret place. And your father, who sees in secret, will reward you openly. When a husband and wife get married, before their marriage, there's a relationship that we, they have with each other that everybody sees. And there is a relationship that they desire that they cannot have legally in God's eyes until they're married. Right? And so they're waiting. They're waiting until that, that wedding day. The guy's attracted to the girl. The girl is attracted to the guy. They're passionate. They're in love. They're on fire for each other. But they're waiting. They're waiting. And then the day comes when a relationship is built that nobody else can see. It is between the husband and the wife where they satisfy each other and they satisfy each other to a point that they don't need anybody else. And at that moment when they are together, nothing outside that door matters. This is how the Lord spoke this to me. When we repent, we are automatically married to the Father because of what Jesus did. We are the bride. We are the bride. When it says, go into, but when you pray, go into your room. There is a relationship between a husband and wife that nobody needs to know about. You don't talk about it, you should don't share it. It's between you two. There's a relationship with God and you that God wants to have with you that nobody should hear about, nobody should know about. And when you understand this relationship, when you are behind a closed door with the Father and spending time with Him and His presence is upon you, nothing else in the world matters. That is the secret place where we close our eyes, we get on our knees and we feel His presence. You want to save souls? You want to know the heart of the Father? You go. He's waiting for you. He's waiting for you back there. See, my life was a wreck. My life was horrible. See, maybe you're sitting here today and saying, Vlad, but you don't know my life. But Vlad, God can't love me. You might be saying to yourself, Vlad, you don't know the sins I've committed. You don't know the depression I go through. God can't use me. God doesn't want to see me. I know. I know what it's like being 17, 18 years old and in a full-out methamphetamine addiction. I know what it's like being 19 years old. Your wife is at home with a child. And you just, you're so addicted. You want to go back. But you're so addicted. I know what it's like being so messed up in the head to where your mentality is when you go and rob people and you hurt them. You have no heart for it. And when somebody says, man, that, that you went too far. And you're, you're understanding your mind is so messed up. You say, you know what? If he was in my position, he would have done the same thing. I know what it's like. I know what it's like thinking, when is this going to be over? I know what it's like being hopeless. I know what it's like praying for death. I know what it's like waiting for death. I know what it's like sitting at 3 o'clock in the morning with a loaded pistol thinking, is tonight the night I'm going to finish this? I know what it's like. 
But I also know that when you give him a chance, he comes. He's more real than me right here or you right there. We are specks of dust. He's forever and ever. If you're thinking here today and you're sitting, but I don't know. See, when we were worshiping, the Lord said something to me. He said, tonight, a lot of people will be changed. Their prayer life tonight will be changed. See, I don't know the Bible too well. I'm not a Bible scholar. But I have an experience with the Lord. I can't bring you great and fancy speeches, but I can bring, bring you personal experience of my success. I can tell you the joy of going, closing yourself in the secret place and praying for your family and for your friends and God answers. I can tell you the joy of his presence. I'd like to invite the worship band to come up, please, and play before we go into prayer. See, the Holy Spirit today, he wants to change a lot of our a lot of ours, our priorities. He wants to change our prayer life. He wants us to dedicate ourselves to him more today. You're married to Christ. You're married to the Father. Marriage doesn't have to be, you're his wife, he's your husband, he's, you're his child, you're his beloved, you're his only one. There is no other. Let's close our eyes for a moment, bow our heads. Don't stand up just yet. Has anybody ever really asked God, why do you give us an answer if we ask you in the secret place? I asked the Father this very recently. This is the second half of my very recent revelation. I said, Father, why? Why can't I just ask at church or why can't I just ask in front of anybody what I want and receive it? Why does it have to be in a secret place? Spirit spoke to my heart and he said because I want you to be with me so much I want you to give yourself to me nobody there just you and I spending time one-on-one -on -one together and I know it is difficult he said and I knew from the very beginning that it will be difficult for you to do this and so I made a promise that if you give me your time and if you spend time with me alone, I promise to give you anything you ask for. The Father loves you so much and He wants to be alone with you so much that He's ready to give you anything you ask for. Anything. 